Dr. Alan Middleton for joining us today, and, and thank you to all of you that are uh, are coming on board. Um, and, and again, I just want to reiterate, you know, why we're doing this. We, um, when everyone, when everything changed in our worlds, and we all started working from home, people started asking us questions: uh, What should we be doing? Where should we be going to? And um, as as researchers, we thought it best to provide information. So. Uh, Part of that is we've uh, we've launched some new studies. For those of you who don't see our weekly COVID tracker, uh, it comes out every Tuesday, I believe. Um, and we measure the opinions of Canadians and Americans as it relates to uh, where we are right now. What should we be doing before we start to reopen for business? What is our trust levels of various uh, government and uh, government levels? Different. Uh, media, that idea. Uh, and I don't know if you saw one of the recent stats this week is that uh, of employed Canadians, 50% of us are working at home now, yet 79% of us are, see, are seeing it as a positive experience. So for no matter what happens, when things start to change and we go back to work, our work balance, home balance, office, it's going to be changed forever based on what we've seen and how we've gone. So that type of information is being uh, put into that. We also launched two syndicated studies looking very specifically at different aspects of uh, Canadians' behavior. One is the consumer behavior during and after the pandemic, um, looking at uh, CPG purchasing retail behavior. What are we doing as Canadians now? And it's interesting there that 18% of Canadians have adopted one new online behavior for the first time. So if we're adopting those behaviors and it goes well, that will also change how we pursue online behavior after this. Um, the also the other thing is that, uh, I, I, for example, even using this, Alan, this is your first time with uh, GoToWebinar, so we've got you the first time on that. This is not my first time, but apparently the first time that I know how the question window works. So for all of you that were on last week asking questions and Terry and I were wondering why aren't we getting questions. We uh, we figured that part out now, so we're able to to work on that. The other syndicated study we launched is interacting with the healthcare system before and during and after the, the pandemic. Um, basically, looking at how Canadians Canadians with and without chronic disorders and how their interaction with the healthcare system is affecting their own personal health, their use of medications. Um, you know, are they having to being asked to uh, to take less medication in order to allow it to last longer because they, there's not as much available. All those sorts of things we're going to be looking at in that one as well. So, and, and then the last piece of our puzzle was these webinars. Uh, we talked with uh, Dr. Flynn last week on crisis communications. Um, we talk, we're talking with Dr. Middleton today about brand health. Next week we have Dr. Jacques Natel looking at uh, the future of retail. Where, where, how is retail going to adjust and shift, uh, or should it adjust and shift uh, after all of this? And then the last week we'll be with Dr. Alex Sevigny looking at uh, our, our, our new adapting, our old going back to, what are we doing with social media? How has that changed? And um, Alex and I have done an 11-year study called the Social Media Reality Check. We're updating some numbers for that. We'll share that with you at that time. We're just coming out of field right now. So all of that, long-winded to say, thank you, Alan, for joining us today. Um, quick introduction. So the, I'm Dave Schultz. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Leger's Toronto office. Um, but it's not about me that you're here to, here to listen to. It's uh, Dr. Middleton who we have worked with for many years as part of uh, Leger's academic committee. Um, I have an introduction I'm going to read, so everyone sit back, take a cup, a cup of coffee, because this is going to take a few minutes. Um, okay. Make it short, and, Alan, otherwise I'll yeah, go to school. I, I shortened it, it's shorter. Uh, yeah. Alan uh, started as a, as a, as a, in a variety of marketing roles, uh, working around the world and concluding as the president and CEO of J. Walter Thompson in Japan, executive VP and a board director of the worldwide company. He then moved into the academic world where he's been working for 26 years, including teaching at Rutgers Graduate School of Business in the US, uh, leading business schools in Argentina, China, India, Russia, and Thailand. He is and currently the marketing faculty at the Schulich School of Business. 
Uh, in 2001, he took over as executive director of the Schulich Executive Education Center. Alan has also co-authored the books Advertising Works Part 2, uh, or 11, I'm assuming it's Part 2, and Chronica, A Field Guide to Canada's Brandscape, and of course has published numerous papers and book chapters. He is a co-founder of the Cassie Advertising Awards, a member of the Canadian Marketing Hall of Legends, a holder of the ACA Gold Medal for Contribution to the Marketing Industry, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for Service to the Literacy Movement, and IABC Communicators Toronto Communicator of the Year Award. So I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to uh, ask Alan uh, just to talk a little bit about brands right now. Absolutely. Unfortunately, yeah, um, um, introductions like that, it reminds me of one of my brand characteristics, which is age. So I just <laughs> so it depends. Uh, those of you who are uh, running or in charge or helping brands, what's the bad news and the good news? Well, I mean, you know, Netflix is doing very well. Thank you very much. Um, a number of retailers aren't doing too badly. But for instance, in the US, the clothing industry dropped by about 50% in the first two, two months. Furniture and appliances by 25%. In France, except for grocery chains, their business dropped 25%. So what's going on? What, what can we do as brands? So let's do some very quick um, uh, sort of key issues. And then we'll uh, have a question and answer with David and with you. Number one priority, love your existing customers. The evidence is twofold of what's happening right now. If people can continue to access their current brands, they're sticking with them. But if they're going to have difficulty in this environment accessing new brands, the evidence is there's something like a 65% agreement that they're prepared to try new brands. So think about it. You know, if you make it more difficult to get hold of your brand, if you make it less appealing in terms of not demonstrating some understanding of what's happening in the world, then you're at risk because there's a lot of trial going on, but people don't want to try everything that fits into their normal lives. What they are prepared to do is to try a new thing in their new lives. Remember when you're dealing with the brands, what the, the old adage, which is notice, believe, and feel. You've got three aspects that build brands. What they know about it and the value it has for them and whatever reason you choose to use the brand. Essential appeals, how it looks, how it feels. But most important is what's emerging that we've all seen for a long time is the importance of emotional connections with the brand. Now, in this world, what does that mean? You know, what, what does an emotional connection mean? Um, number one, it's one way is to develop sympathy and develop an understanding of what's going on. And you're seeing that from a lot of advertisers for their brands at the moment. Number two, step up and be seen as helpful in the community. Canada is much more of a community, everybody work together kind of environment than our friends down south. So, for instance, I'll call out a brand that's doing very well on this, which is Loblaws. Loblaws have not only um, uh, responded well to their staff needs, but they've gone out and they're now uh, giving priority to healthcare workers in, in shopping. It's the right kind of thing to do. But other emotions are also, we can get bored stiff at home. So what can we do as a brand to add some excitement? What can we do if we're feeling lonely? What can your brand to do within its aspect to help people connect with other people? In a sing a long way, like, like uh, uh, singing in choir, choir, or things like that. The point is emotion isn't just sympathy for what's happening, but understanding that in, in, in a broader sense. So what kind of emotion should you focus on? And then I'll shut up and let David get in. Um, <laughs> that whatever emotion has been the property or the value or the, the association with your brand. You know, we saw this when corporations started taking their brands into donations and, and into uh, engaging communities. Initially, they were all over the place and it made no sense. 
what you've got to understand like the corporation is what is your the brand stand for what's its emotional basis and what can you do in this environment to heighten that brand value that that you already have there so don't scatter and throw everything at everything but decide what is your brand territory so that's why understanding what your brand value is and what the emotion behind it is is so critical so i'll shut up for a minute and uh, david uh, why don't we hand back to you yeah no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna i got a couple of questions to follow up on that and if anyone does have questions there is a tab on the right of your screen mentioned questions feel free to fill that in and we are happy to answer them. As I said, we figured that out from last week's webinar. We now know actually, and for those of you who did ask uh, last week, I do have your questions and we will follow up with, uh, with you to still answer those uh, just more remotely this time. The, um, you know, you talk about what does your brand stand for? This is something hopefully that people already know going into this, um, but this changes things. So on day one, maybe not day one, day 10, or we're now day 40 of this, whatever it is, but at the beginning of it, what should brand owners be doing to start to think about, um, you know, defining their brand? And, and, has, and how do you know if your brand's definition has changed as a result of this? Because I agree with you, you don't want to just start throwing stuff uh, and see what's going to stick with people. That's not going to help you through this. But if you... If you already know your brand, or if you don't know your brand, what should people have been doing early on in this? Right, absolutely. Well, you're gonna love the answer, my first answer to your question, which is regain new uh, connection with your customers. Yeah. Understand what's going on in their minds. Because you're right, for loads of people, you've got two curves. Either people not doing anything because unfortunately they've been laid off, or people working like crazy because of the extra pressure. So how can your brand help in that world and what are your customers experiencing and what are they finding going on? Second then is to say, okay, what is my competition doing? How do I understand how my relationship with my customers in this new world can help better? Now, work some scenario. I, in, in our own uh, executive training business, We've done two phases uh, approaches. What we think is going to happen between now and September, which is maybe a gradual term, but it will be very slightly different. Then what do we think is going to be really changing more permanently? And what we're looking at is where our brand and where our offering stands to fit into those two levels. So one's a kind of projection for what you think is going to happen. And yes, a lot of this is guesswork. But more importantly, it's doing some contingency. So I'm going to use a word that's been around uh, business training for two or three years is even more important now. And that's the word agile. And agility. Ability to turn much more quickly to meet new needs as they come up. So know your customer, do some intelligent hypothesizing, about how it's affected them in their habits. So let's take cooking if you're a food company. Right now, I think there's lots of opportunity for doing two types of menus. Menus for quick and easy and readily available food using your products, but also how you experiment a bit, how you add more interest, how you take people who have not been great on using recipes to gradually take it further. Because there's the need, and in my doctoral research, this is what I found about uh, grocery shopping. It's a blend of ritual and exploration. And I think what everybody needs to apply, thinking about their consumer in the future, is what rituals, what things do they want to hang on to about your brand, because that's important. But what can we help them explore so that it becomes more interesting, exciting, and most importantly, fitting in with the new world. Oh, that's very interesting. And, and along with that, so you talk about the ritual of, of shopping. So we have a question from jo uh, our old friend, Joanne McNeish. Mm. If a product linked to a brand is on permanent stock and it's out, such as Lysol wipes, hand sanitizer, 
what is the impact on the brand when customers are confronted with empty shelves? So uh, are, are, is a, that's the ritual. That ritual has now been broken because of that. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question and a key issue. Goes back to what I was saying, which is understanding what your people need. So if you're out of stock, um, one, uh, try to avoid that as much as possible by working with <laughs> retailers to make it happen. Make sure you're communicating to customers if you've got an alternative delivery system. So if some of you are adding direct sale, which might be worth thinking about in some places, that might be uh, important to get out and, and communicate. If you can't do that, and if you're still uh, you know, based on uh, out of stocks, then what we should be doing is making sure you communicate where they can find it. Now, you, you're expected by what you do with the retailer on this because you don't want to piss off the retailers at this stage. But the key is to make sure that they don't find a ready substitute more than once or twice. You might get away with being out of stock for a bit and therefore not available to that person once or twice. But as soon as it happens with some frequency, you've got people moving into a new ritual of behavior and acceptance. The other element is don't give up on your communication. If you've got a superior product emotionally, rationally, then you need to be convincing people of that. So even if they can't get you, they're feeling a little bit, well, oh, I'm using this one, it's not as good. Oh, thank God it's back. So you <laughs> rediscovery uh, issue. Right, that's right. And another question, which I think kind of plays along with that, if it's from Nicole McClaws. Um, and you, you talked about how well Loblaws is doing. This is a Nicole specific question. We're gonna paraphrase a little bit. And, and they're doing a great job at uh, showing that they're helping the community that they're providing a positive service. Um, other companies are doing a great job at showing us that they're selling during this COVID crisis. So there, you, you obviously, you want to balance that. You want to continue your business structure. I still, yep. you know, we still want to continue along doing business, but we want to show that we're helping out within the community as well. So business has come into a challenging environment. You need to drive those sales, but mm -hmm. you want to do it in a thoughtful and appropriate way. How do you do that in the context of a brand through all this? Yeah. Um, number one, going back to understanding your customer again. But number two, in general, this is a time where you need to be thinking about beyond just the raw sale. You don't give that up entirely, obviously. You need to be reinforcing what it is about your brand that uh, is has been successful for you in the past about the brand. But it is now the brand in context of this new environment. And that's the way to think about it. So don't think about them as two alternatives. Think about them, I'll, I'll use a cleaning product as example. You know, a good way to talk about cleaning products, if I don't know the brands here, so I'm, I'm not gonna tread on any one toes, but if you've got a cleaning product that's used extensively, for instance, in the healthcare system, by supply to hospitals or care homes, tell people that because that not only reinforces a degree of importance and, and effectiveness about the, the product, but it also says we're there and we're helping. And even better if you, you know, um, donate some of it to, to you know, help them clean up when the military moves into the healthcare and the hospital. So if it was, let me take a horrible number. If you were 7525, brand proposition to sell, 25% was you know, how we operate as a community engaged brand, you might want to move that round to 6535. It's that kind of dimension. Now, obviously, that's going to change depending on the institution. So if you're a bank, you'll look at it differently than selling a raw product. Right. Right. That's the kind of thinking. You do need to adjust, but my key um, recommendation Think about the values of your brand to your customers in light of what they're experiencing in the community and make that the link. Okay. When, when a company like 3M gets into all the conversation that went on about that, um, you know, obviously there was there's an opportunity there for us. To, I didn't know 3M made masks and 
it's a very positive thing to hear that they're doing this, but then there was also the issues with shipments and U.S. government and all the rest. How, how, does, how do you manage, if, if you were advising 3M, how do you manage that type of problems going on? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it's or, or, or is that a really, you feel free to say, Dave, ask another question. If that's a question you can't answer or don't want to, or you work with the 3M, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, uh, if I was 3M, I, I'd hire us and we'll charge great consulting fees and help them do it. Um, <laughs> but, um, right now, I thought they handled it as well as they could. They just need to get that message out there. 3M has tended to be, and here's an example of a brand that has strong credibility, but has been a bit behind the scenes for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. so not well known to a lot of people that they had this engagement and the example use is right with masks. Gee, I didn't know they did that. Well, let 3M get out there and talk about how many things they're doing and make or have been innovated behind that now have become important in people's lives. Masks, gowns, all this kind of stuff, laundry, you know, whatever it is. So get out without saying, hi, you know, we're here and don't worry, we're, we're saving you with masks. But get a better understanding of what that brand stands for because it can be looked at in a new light within this new environment. Um, now, fortunately for them, the, the US government got most of the, the media hits on what happened about the restriction. And 3M, given the credit, responded very quickly to say after that had been fixed, they're back supplying. But you've got to take more control. There will be a tendency by brands to want to cut back in its communication at this time. Why? Money. Very simple. All of a sudden, your advertising sales ratios are going to the dump because your overall volume in so many categories are down. So there'll be a tendency to pull the communication. And you will have to restrict it more just economically but don't slash it because you need two things going on just like we need to see the end of the curve of covid we need to bottom out a curve on sales for those that are being affected but very importantly in addition you won't be able to get it all back when there's a new normal state without having some of this connecting communication about the brand while this is going on. So you need to keep some going. And in maybe cases like 3M, maybe even step it up. Okay. I'm, I'm getting behind in questions, so I'm going to stop asking what I find interesting, but I also find this as well. Lindsay McKenzie from uh, CBC and an MCM student that uh, Terry and I know well. Um, it says, today we are seeing more companies hiring user design researchers um, to understand customers better through data and personalization. Do you think marketers might benefit from this expertise when making an intelligent hypothesis about customers? Absolutely. Um, you yeah. mentioned one of the key trends that was going in marketing in general um, for a while. Uh, two of them, uh, data analytics and secondly, personalization which is understanding how uh, people relate individually within their brands. We, although there's a lot of research on branding, we've tended sometimes to be a bit mass in our thinking about it. We still think about, we don't think about demographic target groups so much as user-based and what the motivation is, but we need to dig into more of the, 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 the individual thinking. So any organizations that can help us with that both in terms of the real numbers of what's happening, but also how I make it connect with that individual will really help. Okay. Good. Okay, so the next three questions, we're going to go a little over 1230 because these are really fun. Um, sorry. What about financial institutions? Uh, yeah. uh, what if we don't, what if a brand does what's needed? But could you still, you know, is there still a possibility for negative sentiments from clients? What do you, you know, industries that are heavily affected by market issues like this, so thinking of financial institutions, yeah. what, what should, they, what, how could they be looking at this right now? You talk about not communicating, and I think we're seeing some of that. We're seeing the message, we're here to help, 
on all our online banking, insurance forms, or whatever it may be. We're here to help. But beyond that, some are pulling back because I think they're afraid to communicate. So what's your recommendations in a sector like that? Here's an example where you need to understand what your, how your brand is perceived. And as let me take the banks as the example, the major banks. As we know from the Leger uh, Reputation Index, the banks don't always score that well. Um, they're not loved. So you've got to take that as, an, an, a, as, a, as a background. Banks in general, when you think about them in general, are regarded as rich places uh, which I need to operate in. However, banks have the opportunity through their online presence and through their branch presences of developing personalized, back to that theme again, yeah. connections with people. Yeah. So I'd be pushing that. So instead of looking at your marketing communication and your activity in marketing as a broad-based uh, response, I'd be letting much more, um, uh, uh, you can't allow every branch to make their own decisions, right. but allow more motivation to online connections and branch connections to understand individual customers. And here's the advantage for the banks, which is the one big advance of social media, which is you start doing that and you get a significant number. Let's say there's a branch in Northern Toronto where they're doing a particularly good job. That will start going around on the tom-tom drums of social media. Yeah. So it's a different way of coming at it. So stop thinking about banks or insurance companies as institutional brands. Start thinking about them as the service providers by their excellent staff online and in person. So we okay. So banks and insurance. What about investment companies? Is uh, that the same thing? Yeah, um, very much the same thing, um, because everybody's financial situation has now changed. Yeah, all us, here I was looking at regular increase in what I've got invested, and all of a sudden, <laughs> oh shit, look what happened. Oh dear, <laughs> is the oil price ever going to go up? Oh, the, 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 the market's going to recover. I need some help. Um, <laughs> I need some help understanding that. But don't be unrealistic. The financial advisors, the investment organizations that are realistic about this will do better than those that are pie in the sky. Nobody with half a brain, that means all your audience, knows life is gonna go back to brilliantly wonderful normal within a month or two. We all know that's not gonna happen. Don't promise it. Show how people can come back with maybe limited, more limited income, maybe more uncertain income. Um, changes in what your strategy must be in order to get that planning for, you know, maybe it's no longer uh, retiring at 65, maybe it's 70. Maybe, you know, I yeah. need to really put aside a fund for my kids. So again, it's back to that more individual understanding, but with reality. Okay, so let's move off corporate for a second and talk about universities and colleges. <laughs> Something close to your heart. You're recruiting for first year students. Yep. How are you gonna amplify your brand to prospective students who don't have that ritual of your brand. They haven't, they're not attending your campus. They're yeah. not, you know, will there even be a fall semester in person, online? What will be that experience? Yeah. So how do you start talking about your brand to these prospective students? The most important thing, and this is true of all online versus in-person experiences. You've got to step up to make the online experience as rich as the in-person experience as possible. So obviously I'm gonna talk a little bit about Schulich. What Schulich's yeah. been doing is using the technology to make sure you've got real uh, communication going across the classes so they can learn from each other as well as the instructor. That there's a whole bunch of practices going on that engage them in problem solving. In other words, it's a rich experience. It's a different experience but it's a rich experience. That, that integration and association is really important. How you keep the brand going is you demonstrate, and again, social media, but also talking about it, how you've taken the quality of how you built the reputation 
online. The danger with online for all of us, including my business, <laughs> is that it will be seen as a cheap commoditization version of what the in-person experience has been. We yeah, have yeah. to think about it and deliver it as being a different but not lower quality learning experience. And that's what the universities and schools particularly need to, need to uh, uh, do. But we must not lose track of something in all this, which is kids, students, adults, anybody in education need to learn and interact with each other as well as the instructor and the program. And that becomes absolutely critical in how we use the existing technology, but very important, how the technology develops. Yeah, that's, very, that's a really good point. Okay, let's talk about tourism for a second. Hmm. So, uh, Marcello Gomez Wickstern, uh, sorry, the last question was from Carlene Carroll. I don't know if you know Carlene, but she's quite a good follower of Leger's world. So, Marcello's asking, um, these are these are businesses that are obviously there isn't much they can do right now. Tourism, um, attractions, uh, events, that idea. So, what can you do to talk right now? How, how do you balance between complete silence because you don't want to be seen as relevant or inappropriate with your messages that aren't related to COVID nineteen, but also continue to connect in a tasteful manner with your followers on social media to keep them engaging. Like, and if you have any examples of who you think might be doing well, uh, Marcello's looking for those as well. It's, it's a tough place to be right now in the tourism sector. Nice. I mean, it's a tough place for, uh, I mean, let me put it into two categories. Let me talk about uh, domestic tourism, moving around here, uh, visiting places, and international tourism, including the US and, and everywhere else. Yeah. Internationally, let me deal with the easy one, but the most difficult one first is going to be really tough. The airlines are already talking. IART has already had meetings in, in Europe about significantly reducing the number of flights, reducing the amount of, uh, by quite substantial amounts, the, the numbers coming out of their meeting. Airlines are looking at cutting something like 30 to 35% of their flights. So it's going to be quite dramatic. So international tourism, it's going to be a longer period. And what they need to be doing is planning what they can do for that longer period to give virtual experiences, but also plan of how they're going to bring it back. You know, what is it particularly about their location? But let's talk about domestic tourism, mm -hmm. which has a much better capability of recovering quicker. As soon as we're allowed to move around, and I realize today, uh, we've said do not visit High Park because um, you can't look at the cherry blossoms. So even that's being restricted at the moment. So what can you do? In the very short term, minimize. Um, you're, you're throwing money away by doing much right now. Keep a little a murmur of stuff going on about what the attraction is. But as soon as people are allowed to drive, to move around, even though it's maybe at a distance, Help them rediscover. Now, I have to uh, admit something. I'm on the research committee of the Ontario, uh, Toronto, Destination Ontario, um, which is the group that works with private and government to promote tourism in Ontario. So recognize I, I have a vested bias. Right. But there's so much for people living in Ontario that they haven't seen in Ontario that as soon as there is an ability to move around by car, by train, let alone plane. These institutions should be out there saying, you've been really good, you've stayed at home. Have you been to the Agua Canyon and taken the ride? Because there's exciting stuff around. And what I'd be doing is concentrating that. Let's take the timing. Let's say we can move around more by the fall, by September. I'd be really plugging what you can do during the winter time in a lot of these areas. So save the money right now. You're not going to build a residual. It's not on people's minds. But as soon as it looks like something's opening up, that's where you need to be spending the money. And for domestic tourism, think about all the things you've got to see in Ontario that people haven't seen. You know, yeah. when was the last time, and, and also I'll fess up, I'm also one of the committees of Royal Ontario Museum. 
when was the time you went to the museum? Have a look online at what it's got because they're doing a lot of stuff online. But also, as soon as you're allowed to go there with the kids, yeah, I've been to the museum. People tell me, when did you go? Oh, three or four years ago. <laughs> it's not a museum. And that's what these institutions need to get to people. They're new again for people coming out of this shut in. Good. Okay, so to that end, though, let's go. I'm going to go back to the prairies a bit. Uh, Laura, Laura from uh, Regina has a question. How do you, because I think this applies to the, the answer you just gave as well. How do you do this if you're without, do you do it indirectly or directly without making the comment about COVID? Are you, are you, is there a harm in reminding people of the pandemic when you're talking to them? But you can talk, I, I, I you know, my, my instincts say you can talk about it without talking about it. What do I mean by that? Yeah. Recognizing what the consumers experienced with COVID is they've been restricted in where they can go. I see no problem identifying that as an experience for people. who are basically saying, because of what's been happening, you've had limited ability to move around and to explore new territories, new things. You know, when this happens, here's your ability to go out and explore. So make that comment. So it's not reminding of COVID per se, but the impact of COVID on what it's had as an impact on people's lives. Yeah, that's true. Actually, Greg Gerard makes an interesting point about tourism, just going back a second. Tourism relies, and, and this doesn't apply to every venue, obviously, but tourism relies on four months of summer revenues to pay for 12 months of expenses. Yep. Tourism revenue is, is measured by summers. This summer, reports say we'll lose 30% of our businesses. Next summer, recovery, there'll be three summers to recover from this. So it's it's really a long window approach on something like that to, to start just from a sales perspective, but the brand doesn't need to suffer during that time. Absolutely. Um, so we promised him. I would automatically. Canada, except for some good work by the province of Alberta recently, or before um, the COVID crisis, started getting in to say, don't forget us in winter. And I think that other than skiing and snowshoeing and hockey, we don't think there's anything to see and experience in some of these places in winter. Yeah. I know there's a cost issue, you know, which is how much are you going to you know, have people uh, running a, a, a winter environment? So you've got real issues of summer revenue and volume versus winter. But you need to be thinking more narrowly in terms of what the opportunities are so maybe it's only two or three weeks when there's special things happening but it's that kind of thinking that needs to go on that's very interesting all right alan we promised everyone a half an hour and we're starting to lose a few people but i have two questions left so oh, well. for those of you who are left on we're going to do two more questions and then we're going to uh we're going to bow out for this week um cam pierce asks what about public transit in terms oh, yeah. of the brands of you know, from what you and I know, TTC, Go Transit, but then obviously Edmonton Transit, as you move across the country, every uh, city has its own version of that. Um, what do you see for that brand? Because lots has gone on there in the last six weeks as well. Exactly. It, huh. um, yeah. that, one's, that one's a difficult one. I'll tell you why. I didn't tell you this would be easy. That's why we saved that, that one near the end. This one's hard because there's a good news and there's a bad news. So let's go with the bad news. Will people be moving around less and doing more work from home using the technology? Yes. Will there be changes in people's work patterns to accommodate that? Yes. So will there be likely, not a decline, but a certainly softening of any growth that there's been in people's travel movement? And the answer is yes. However, the good news is um, and I don't have good news for the oil industry in this one. I think there's an opportunity of public transit stepping up to this point and being more available for those fewer trips. So understanding use of technology, different routes that people can go on or mm -hmm. um, at different times and, and things like that, different experiences. If you look at, and I'll use um, Sweden as an example, um, Stockholm has a transit system where the application of, of its information 
is linked into the local equivalent of uh, um, um, the, the ride shares and bicycle paths and walking paths. So what you can do in Stockholm, you can say, here, I want to go from A to B. This is on your app. And I've relaxed, so I'd like to have some exercise and look at some scenery. So it will construct the journey for you using a blend of public transport, local cycles if they're available, or ride share, or walking paths, so you can construct the whole trip of how I get to do it. If you want to do it fast, it'll, it'll give that application. That's the thinking we need to do. Transportation is not just A to B. It's understanding how people get from the A, which is where they start, to the B, where they want to end up, but with the C, how they get there in the middle yeah. as considered as part of it. Okay, good. All right, so last question. We, we have to go back to uh, hygiene and cleanliness because why would we not after six weeks of discussing it? Uh, this is from Diane at uh, Paradigm Public Relations. Do you think that hygiene and cleanliness will supersede sustainability claims in the future? Oh, what a good Because it's interesting. For the last few years with our reputation study, we're starting to measure more and more how sustainability is impacting corporate reputation. Will I be now looking at next year measuring how hygiene and cleanliness is going to impact reputation? You know, basically, you know, we used to look at single use packaging versus re reusable. You know, all these, are we going to care more about hygiene permanently or is, it is this just a temporary thing? So uh, are we shifting our mindset and our brand's going to have to start looking at that as an important factor now? Um, and the answer is yes-ish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always-ish. And, and I, I think it's going to vary. And this is one where there may be a demographic as well as a habit, habitual issue. Older populations, and we've seen the devastating impact on more elderly populations in institutions. Older populations will definitely be more worried about the health issues. Vaccines, ability for um, the, the, the handle problems and that kind of stuff. Younger generations, and I'm not so much talking about the millennials as the next generation, Gen Z or the centennials, mm -hmm. which is, I think they'll come back beyond the health focus much quicker. Now, will it be a higher um, uh, issue than before? Yes. I think everybody knows that, that by listening to good medical advice and good people looking at this, pandemics are not new. This one's an extreme but it's not going to be the last one. So I think there will be an ongoing increase, even with the younger populations, in thinking about it. But let me come to the sustainability issue. Um, because again, here's where I think we need to stop thinking in silos. We need to think about sustainability and health in a whole bunch of areas where they do overlap. Now, whether it's finally proven that this virus started with the wet markets in Wuhan or not. And there's some conspiracy theorists who think this is all manipulated by the Chinese government, which I think is bullshit. You know, there is an issue between how we work with animals, how we work with animals in the environment and our health. You talk right. to any indigenous leader in this country who's got half a brain and understanding of their heritage, they understand that linkage. We, since the Industrial Revolution, have developed education systems and thinking systems where we parcel all these into different uh, areas. Well, they're not. They're interlinked. And I think whatever happens when we've got good research on the background of COVID-19 and the link between animal markets, people, and environment, that's where we need to start applying a lot of the work. Perfect. Alan, thank you very much. I, I did not ask the question, which was, did you and I coordinate our wardrobe today? So uh, <laughs> We're all blue. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, so thank you for this. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. Um, please join us next week with uh, Dr. Jacques Natel when we talk about retail. We will be sending everyone who attended a, um, a link to download the recording of this if you want. 
Um, and if anyone has David, Brendan, what's that, Alan? On yes, Monday, and Alan, please do a quick promotion as well. Yes. Monday at eleven o'clock, you can sign on to one of our chats, uh, where we have the president and CEO of Roche Canada uh, being interviewed by me um, to talk about leadership in this environment. And Roche Canada has some very interesting stuff to say about this. Oh, that's fantastic. So that's Monday at 11. You got it. can get to it through the Schulich. Through our, the Schulich Exec Education Centre site. And, Perfect. Or, or just send me a note. Okay. So same thing, send me a note if anyone has any questions. Uh, as I said, we'll be following up. If you want copies of our weekly COVID tracker, that's available on our website, Ledger 360 And then... Um, uh, you can also sign up for the syndicated studies there as well if you want. So thank you again, Alan. Really Have a great day. So everybody should access it. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye,